you guys from last time. We were in the middle of uh, figuring out the splitting criteria for decision trees. And this is the data set that we're going to use. It has 12 data points. And we have um, the different features that we could potentially split on, which have to do with whether the customer is going to wait for a table at the restaurant. So we're going to try and construct trees like this from the data set. All right. So we figured out that we're going to do greedy tree induction, and we're trying to decide between these two splits. You guys have already decided that this split has more information about the label than that split. Um, so we are uh, we are going to try to formalize that and have a measure of information that will allow us to um, to put to put the number here and a number here that shows this number is better. Okay, great. So we were in the middle of talking about information theory, and I defined for you last time that the information um, from observing the occurrence of an event is defined as the number of bits needed to encode the probability of the event. Okay, so it is negative log 2p bits. So a coin flip from a fair coin, one bit of information. Um, if the event is going to happen for sure, then you, you, it just needs zero bits of it. Okay, so we just have, we have these numbers just to sort of, you know, make sure you understand that, you know, fair coin, one bit of information, if it's going to land on heads with probability 0.99, that's really not very much information. It's going to happen anyway, probably. And then, but if it happens, if it lands on heads with probability 0.01, that's going to give you a whole lot of information. You're very surprised when that happens. Okay. So if we had a whole lot of events, um, then we can take the expectation of the information from those events, just the definition of, of expectation there, um, plugging in the definition of information as negative log 2p, and that's called the entropy. Okay, and as I mentioned last time, um, the, um, if you have, uh, if you have um, kind of probabilities that are even, the entropy is sort of one, and if the probabilities are like very different from each other, the entropy is really small. Okay, so low entropy means sort of you gathered up all the sand and made a sandcastle. <laughs> okay, so this is high entropy, probability half half. This is low entropy, which is like you know, an order. This is chaos. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, I shouldn't say chaos. I should, I should say the world's natural sort of order. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, so we can plot entropy as a function of P and it looks like this, okay? So if the, if the two probabilities, right? This is heads and tails, right? <laughs> if the probability of landing heads is half uh, and the tails is half, you are here at very high entropy, the highest possible entropy, and then um, otherwise <laughs> it gets lower, okay? Good. And so for decision tree splitting, of course, we're going to want things as, as here or here, because that means that you've got all the positives. <laughs> it means you've got all positives or all negatives. Okay, great. So again, why are we talking about this for a decision tree lecture? Because we're going to try to choose the splits that have low entropy. So I was thinking that I would just very quickly tell you about where this definition of information comes from. It's a little bit of a tangent, but it's kind of a cool thing. And if you've never done anything with information theory, it's kind of nice to know, like, why do we call this information? Like, what, where does that kind of come from? So the way where it comes from is, is this, okay? So if you, want to, if you want to define information, you want to define it to have some properties. And those properties are that the information of an event is always non-negative, right? Information is something that you feel it should be non-negative. And the information from an event that has probability one should be zero, right? We, we know that the event, if, if it's going to happen, then whether it happens, it's going to give you no information. Okay. Also, um, yeah, so that, that's one, that's the first principle. And then the second principle is that the information from two independent events should be the sum of their informations. Okay. That's the second principle. And then we also want information to be continuous in the probability of occurrence, right? So these are the three principles. And when you combine these together, 
right? So this, this one says like slight changes in probability correspond to slight changes in information. So if you just adjust the probability slightly, it shouldn't drastically change the information, right? So those are the three principles. And if you combine those together, um, if you look at this one here, so it's, so this one, if, if P1 and P2 are equal, then you get sort of two, two IP and then I of P squared, okay? And then in general, if you have N independent events all in the same probability, that this thing generalizes to that, right? And so I'm um, just gonna bring that up there so I have more room on my chalkboard, right? Um, and so what it means is, uh, okay, so IP equals, and then I didn't do anything. This is one in disguise. <laughs> okay. All right, and so what it means is that because you can take the N and bring it down, you can take the M here and bring it down, which gives you, which gets you to here. Okay, and so, um, so if I, I put this on the other side, like this, I get to this equation. Okay, and then more generally, um, more generally, so if, if you have, again, if you have N events, you put P, P gets replaced with P to the N, P to the N, and then you can bring the N down again. And then you end up with something like this, okay? So hopefully you can see where, kind of where I'm going now. And so that's true for any fraction N over M where these are integers. So that's all the rationals. And so you might as well just define it for all the positive reals to obey this expression here. And if you do that, the functions that do this are, guess what? Negative log. <laughs> okay, so it's negative log for some base. And if you want to talk about bits, you can just choose B equals two. And that's it, that's the whole derivation. Okay, cool. All right, so by the way, if, if, I, if I go too fast or if you miss something or if you want more background on this, um, all of my lectures for all of machine learning are actually on my website. So you can actually go back and just watch everything. There's, there's LaTeX notes, there's you know, printed notes that so you can go and, and look it all up. And I have a very long set of notes on decision trees. So that, that's, that's all there. All right, so again, um, why are we talking about this for a decision tree lecture? Because it's because we want to create splits that reduce entropy. Okay. So let's go back now to decision trees. All right, so now that you know what information is, you know that entropy is average information, and we're gonna define information gain, which is the splitting criteria for decision trees. So let's say that you are at this particular node in the tree, and um, the rest of the tree is up here somewhere. Right, the rest of the tree is up there. And you, you're just at this part of this, this is a subtree that you're gonna construct, okay? And you have this number of positives and this number of negatives in this chunk of data here that you're going to figure out how to split. All right, so let's say that we're considering a split on a variable called color, and it takes values white, green, beige, and blue. And then you can see that if you split on this variable, you can count the number of positives and negatives of each color, okay? So if I do the split, I can count the number of positives and negatives here, 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 and there, okay? And then um, I can actually calculate the training probabilities in each branch, right? It's the fraction of positives, and then this is the fraction of negatives in the branch. So these are two numbers, P and one minus P, okay? Now, what we really want, <laughs> right? We, 
what is what is good and what is bad here? So what's good is if we have almost all negatives, or if we have almost all positives, right? If we have a pure uh, pure uh, node, and then um, this is this would be bad because it means we have about half positives and half negatives, and it means the split actually hurt us, like or or, or didn't help us at all because we're we're still all mixed up with positives and negatives. Okay, so the information gain is the expected reduction in entropy due to branching on attribute A. So you calculate the original entropy before branching and you subtract um, the entropy after branching. So you can, this is giving you the improvement in entropy after you make that split. Okay, so I've written the two equations here. This is the entropy before branching. So it has all the positives and negatives that are in S. And then over here, I've written, um, this is again, an expectation, right? So this is or an average. This is the sum of all of the, the J's, right? The different colors. And then this is the um, fraction of points that went into that direction. And then this guy is the entropy after that split, right? So let me work out a couple of examples here so that you can see how this works. So let's go back to our, our examples here. And we're going to evaluate the information gain of the split on crowded. So for that split, and could you just, if you could please just remember these numbers for me for just a second. So it's two negatives, zero positives, four positives, no negatives, and then two and six. Okay, so just remember this for a second because we're going to plug those in to our, our thing. Oh, by the way, and we have half positives and half negatives here. Okay. We write those on the board. It's I haven't had any caffeine yet. <laughs> <laughs> Two of those guys, four, zero, and then two and six. Two and four. Oh, I'm sorry, two and four. Yes. Two positive, four negative for the last one. Did I get it right? Oh no, two negatives. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> but, okay, so let's go and calculate that. So before I split, I had half positives and half negatives, which is the entropy of half half. And then after I split, I had, um, let's see here. So this, this two out of 12, I have 12 data points and two of them went to that branch. And then this zero one comes from the fact that they're all negative. Okay, they're all negative. So it's so it's zero, one, probability zero, one. Okay, that's this. And then this one is four out of 12. So four of the points out of the 12 total points went here. And then again, it's probabilities one, zero. They all went over here. And then this guy, six out of 12, six points over here out of the total 12. And then it's two out of six and four out of six which is this two out of six, and then that's four out of six. Okay? Yes? <laughs> Good. Okay, great. So if you go and calculate those numbers out, um, you get uh, this many bits, okay? You get, this is the number of, this is the number of bits you get. Right, so there's a number that tells you the quality of that split, tells you the gain in information after you make the split. And then if you, um, if you look at the other split, right, the other possibility for a split, I'll just go back there and just remind you what that was, which is where it's like half and half every time. <laughs> so if we look at the, the information gain for that one, you already know what it's going to be. You already know that you're not gaining any information by making that split. But um, just to sort of, um, as a sanity check, <laughs> We can plug in all those numbers here. And of course, you're going to get zero bits. So we're good. OK, so now we have like a number that tells us, OK, um, that's the split that we need to do, because we actually, um, we actually uh, reduce the entropy a lot when we make that particular split. OK, so, so far, 
what I have discussed is um, information gain, which is the splitting criteria for the C4.5 algorithm. Now, C4.5 was one of the top 10 algorithms in data mining in that survey that I showed you, the survey paper. Um, this is an algorithm that was designed in 1993, believe it or not. So it's an older algorithm, but it's still something that people use a lot. And um, C4.5, again, chooses the splitting criteria to minimize entropy as much as possible. So I will tell you that there are other splitting criteria too, but there's nearly no time to explain them all because I have much more interesting things that I want to do with you. Um, so what I will discuss now is the pruning criteria, as well as what happens if you don't want to build a tree by splitting and pruning, okay? So next I'm gonna talk about the pruning criteria and I'm gonna switch algorithms to the other really, really popular decision tree algorithm, which is CART. So just a few questions about this um, algorithm, C4.5. Is it only for binary splits? No, C4.5 is not just for binary splits. In fact, the example that I gave you was not a binary split example. because Oh was, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and then I guess I'm wondering how efficient is this because if, if you have multiple splits and you have to search over all possible splits at every, at every node, um, that can end up being very expensive. So how, how do you make it efficient for it at, at scale? Okay, so let's think about how expensive this actually is. Okay. So every, so for, for every, okay. So you take your whole data set, you try out all the features. So you have to calculate this information gain statistic for all of the different possible features. Okay, so you do that for, so this is P features, right? So then you do that. And then after you do that, your, uh, your data sets are maybe half the size they were before. Because after you make that split, your data set has, has halved itself or, or made itself much smaller. So then yes, you do it again. So, so now we're here, we decide whether to make another split. We have to look at all the features again. That's a computation that requires looking at all D features. Um, but uh, your data set is smaller. <laughs> so all the computations are smaller. Um, to be honest, the, the decision trees are one of the cheapest algorithms that you can possibly do, right? If you do it splitting and pruning, if you do it this way. If you do, if you want to fully globally optimize the tree, that is one of the most expensive types of computations that you can do. Okay. okay. So think about, so think about the most, some of the most widely used algorithms like boosted decision trees. For boosted decision trees, you construct a whole bunch of greedy trees and you average them together. So if you can do that, you can see how this computation would be like very, you know, much less computation than constructing lots of trees and, and averaging them. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, great. So let's talk about pruning. So what we could do, and what these algorithms often do, is you keep splitting until you can't split anymore. You just split, 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 go all the way to the bottom, because it's pretty cheap, especially when you're down at the bottom. You have very few data points in each leaf, and so it's very easy to, to split to the bottom. So you'd split until either all of the observations in each leaf have the same class. So these are pure leaves, like that leaf and this leaf. Or you could split until there's nothing else to split on, like you have already split on all the features already. Like you, you know, you split on every possible feature and there's nothing left to split on. So this seems like a bad idea because of course it's gonna overfit the data. So we have to figure out how to prune the trees back so that um so that they don't just keep, you know, it just doesn't it just overfit the data. So I'm going to switch to talking about CART's pruning algorithm. So CART does only binary splits, doesn't do multi-way splits, okay? CART's just, just binary splits. And um, it uses the Gini index for splitting. So it has a slightly different splitting criteria than C4.5's information gain. But to be honest, I can't really understand why, why you, know, you should replace the splitting criteria. Because if you actually plot this, if you actually plot this, um, remember the function of P that I plotted earlier? 
So I plotted the, the entropy as a function of P. Um, the, the one that CART uses is almost identical to the one that C4.5 uses. And so you're going to get almost identical results using that splitting criteria. So that's another good reason why I don't think it's worthwhile to use my valuable time with you talking about this other, this other splitting criteria because they're almost identical. <laughs> so anyway, so it uses a, an almost identical splitting criteria. Um, but its printing criteria is actually really interesting. And that is called uh, minimum cost complexity printing. So the way it works is that each subtree is assigned a cost and you choose the subtree with the lowest cost. Okay, you wanna keep, keep the lowest cost subtree. Okay, so the cost looks like this. And hopefully um, if, if you were here yesterday, which I'm sure all of you were, you would maybe recognize this function as a combination of um, misclassification error and some kind of regularization term. So it's a balance between accuracy and simplicity. And there is a trade-off parameter between these two terms. Okay, so this is again the fundamental thing that all machine learning algorithms optimize is this balance between accuracy and um, simplicity to try to keep the model accurate but also enable it to generalize. So the cost of each subtree is exactly this. It's exactly the misclassification error in that subtree plus a constant times the number of leaves in that subtree. So if the subtree has a whole lot of leaves, that's going to be very expensive for this term. Right? It's going to make, this, make the simplicity cost, complexity cost go up. Um, so essentially, what, what this equation tells us is that every new leaf has a cost of C, right? If you add one more leaf, that's the cost to C. You have to pay for it, the cost of C. And so that means that each new leaf that you're gonna add into the subtree is worth the same thing as having C misclassified points, okay? So if I had a choice between having one fewer leaf in the subtree versus having C misclassified points, I am equal among those two decisions, right? So the only way I would add in another leaf is if it reduced my error by at least C plus one. <laughs> okay, great. So can I Let's ask see. a question? So this is when you've actually done, run your algorithm and got a tree, and then you look at the result of this final tree you've got, and a leaf is the number of sort of endpoints of the tree. So you, you, you then look at your tree and decide whether you want to keep it, whether it's too expensive or something. It's, it's subtrees, yes. Yeah, so you're, you're, gonna, yeah. you're gonna pick and up- you look at a subtree part, part of it, right. Exactly. You're gonna look at the subtree and go, hmm, okay, should I keep this or should I just reduce it to a leaf? Right. And if I reduce it to a leaf, then I have to calculate, then, then this thing is gonna be zero, right? But this thing is going to be like whatever error I get when I reduce it to a field leaf. Okay. So I, so I do this kind of all over the place. I kind of look all over the tree and go, hmm, what about that subtree? Shall I reduce that to a leaf? What about that subtree? Should I reduce that one to a leaf? And you do that over and over again to try to minimize this cost complexity um, equation. Okay. So when you're you know, another way you can think about it is um, when you're sort of designing this tree, um, you have to think about whether each split is going to reduce my error by at least C. So when you're constructing this thing, right? So you could say, okay, I've constructed now this subtree here. If I keep this, does it reduce my error by at least C? <laughs> or this, this one here. I'm keeping this split reduce my error by at least C. If not, I'll get rid of it and just make it a leaf there. All right. So um, I'm just going to show you an example of CART, the, the algorithm that we were just talking about um, on this data set called, this is a famous data set called Tic-Tac-Toe. Um, and the goal of this algorithm is to try to predict whether the X player will win tic -tac a game of Tic-Tac-Toe. Okay. And so the way this tree, um, oh, and the data set is like a whole bunch of tic-tac-toe boards after the game is finished. 
And so every entry of the tic-tac-toe board is either X, O, or blank. Because sometimes when you play tic-tac-toe, um, somebody wins and like some square is not filled. <laughs> okay, um, so the first thing that Cart decided to ask was whether the middle has an O in it. Because apparently if the middle has an O in it, then the X player doesn't usually win. <laughs> so apparently the middle, the middle spot if you're playing tic-tac-toe. <laughs> anyway, okay, so if the O player gets the middle, you're screwed. Okay, so then um, if the middle doesn't have an O, then we ask about the bottom left, okay? Um, whether the bottom left has an O. Okay, so if the bottom left does have an O, okay? So here, the middle does not have an O. Bottom left has an O. What about the top left? Yes, the, the, the top left has an O. So these two are now occupied by O's and the middle left. If the middle left is O, then we have three O's in a row. Uh, and the um, and, and if that's true, then the um, X player cannot possibly win because the O player has three O's in a row. Okay, so that's kind of how this thing, this thing works. This is not a very accurate tree. Um, because this tree has a very high cost complexity parameter. And so it tried to make the tree as small as it possibly could. Um, and so it sacrificed a whole bunch of accuracy doing that. Okay. Um, do I have any questions? Yes. I was wondering like, how do you select C? Like, the... Yeah, that's a good question. It's not really clear how you select C. Um, I think so. Cart has a so cart has a default parameter in it, and you can just use carts. If you want to, you can adjust it. Um, you could make it sort of like one percent. So one percent is a good number to choose because it means that every split has to reduce your error by at least one percent. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep it. Yeah. Why do we want to consider binary splits in this case? So cart just considers binary splits. Um, it's you know it's it's just. Look, it's just parts sort of modus operandi. Um, obviously, it's better if you can do multi-way splits, but um, part just does binary splits. <laughs> um, I didn't design it. This is not my algorithm, but um, that's what it does. Uh, so, for example, for colors, you would be uh, you would have to change the colors into things like um, you know blue or not blue, or you could do blue and green versus yellow and red. How would you split um, something that's like a real number? So you do age is less than 26. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, are there any results in the literature which show that, say, if you do binary splits versus they split into three, there is at least one three that in like each class that achieves similar, similar accuracy? Or, or... Um, okay. So Nina didn't talk about PC dimension yet, right? Okay, so she will, I think she will today. So one way of measuring complexity is by measuring what's called the VC dimension. Um, and in this case, for decision trees, the VC dimension is the number of leaves in the tree. So what you, what you could do is take the data set you're talking about and then calculate how many leaves are in the, these potential trees. And then that would tell you the complexity of the different trees. Okay, so I'm going to switch to um, talking about modern decision tree methods. So I promised you I would go all the way from the beginning to the present day. And so I'm, I'm literally making a jump to that. <laughs> all right. Now, I will point out that the older methods are still very widely used. Um, they are still some of the most widely used methods in machine learning. Um, and so I, I will point out some advantages of them. They, they do tend to be interpretable. At least Cart's trees tend to be very interpretable. Um, C4.5, somehow its default parameters make its trees a little bit unwieldy and large, but Cart's trees tend to be nice and small. And then because you're doing this greedy splitting, because you, you, when you make a split, you no longer second guess what split you made, right? Because you're just making splits from the top down. You don't go back and, and, and rethink those splits. And that means it's greedy. And because it's greedy, it's very fast. Can you explain the technical meaning of the word greedy? 
and you don't look back. <laughs> yeah. You're so you're eating forward. Yes, you you, right. you you eat forward and, it, and you don't look back. Okay. It's not not fully optimized, right? Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so the disadvantages of CART and C4.5 are that because they're greedy, you know, because once you pick a split, you no longer uh, you can no longer change it to a different split. Um, it tends to be less accurate than other methods. So you often hear people saying, "Well, decision trees are not as accurate as support vector machines." And it's like, well, okay, did you use a 1984 algorithm like CART and compare it to, to a 2021 algorithm? Like, I'm not sure you can really make that comparison and, and say decision tree methods are less greedy. What you're comparing is 1983 to 2021. Um, so people do get a little confused as to whether or not decision trees are less accurate than other methods. Certainly things that were created in 1984 might be less accurate than what would be um, created in 2021. Um, also, it's very difficult to adjust the parameters. So you were asking me about how you adjust that. See, there's other parameters too that, that you, you know, might want to adjust in some of these algorithms. Um, and it's not that easy to adjust them to get the results you want because they're doing this greedy thing. There's also no proof of optimality because they're not actually optimizing a global objective. So you have no proof that you've gotten a tree that's somehow optimal in any sense of the word. Now, the modern tree, modern decision tree methods are not greedy. They'll fully optimize every split in the tree. Uh, and they fully um, optimize the cost complexity objective that I showed you earlier. So this balance between error and number of leaves in the tree, you can fully optimize that, um, that trade-off. Okay. Now, before, as I mentioned, we were not allowed to make changes to the splits once we fixed them. We would make a split on rain, and then it would have to stay there forever. And if that was the wrong split, you'd have to waste the rest of the computations further down in the tree, making up for the wrong mistake or the, the problem that you, you did at the top. So now we have to consider all possible splits. And this leads to like a combinatorial explosion in the number of possible trees we could consider. Because now you, you don't need to have rain at the top. Like you, you could actually you know, have a different thing at the top. And you could think about all these different possibilities that you could have. And it would be a very, very large number of, of, of possible trees that you could consider. And you consider every kind of like, you know, a tree doesn't have to look like this. It can be every possible shape too. So it's a huge combinatorial explosion. In the initial one, we were using um, the gain to split, right? Um, but you're saying that it's possible that using gain doesn't give us the, op the optimized outcome. Correct. Okay. Yes. Because remember, now, now you want to globally optimize the cost complexity, right? So you, you want to choose the, the, the first split so that the whole tree will optimize the um, cost complexity. So we might take a lower gain at the beginning to get a higher overall. We got it. That's it. Okay. So, um, so this is the optimization problem we want to solve. We want to minimize over all possible trees. It's cost complexity objective, which is the balance between misclassification error and sparsity, the trade-off parameter C. Again, you can choose C whatever you like, depending on how small you want your tree versus um, the training accuracy. And I often set C to 0.01 because then I trade off 1% of error for every additional leaf in the tree. Okay. So if you solve this, the result of the optimization problem is a tree. So for example, um, this is a tree that I showed you earlier. This is the solution to this optimization problem on this. It's a very famous data set now. It's a, um, a Broward County, Florida re-arrest data set. And uh, um, here we're trying to predict whether somebody will be arrested within two years of filling out um, a form at the uh, police department in Broward County. And so again, this tree um, splits on whether they've had more than three prior offenses and then the person's age and so on and so forth. Okay. So do you all understand the problem that we're trying to solve here? Okay, great. 
So if um, every part of that tree is optimized, the algorithm would not add in a leaf unless it reduced the error by at most seed points. Okay, so there's no greedy splitting and printing. We're looking at all possible trees. And the way we solve this optimization problem is it's actually a dynamic programming technique with a bunch of theorems that reduce the size of the search space. So it's a pairing of theoretical bounds for reducing the search space with techniques for careful storage and lookup of previously solved subproblems. Okay, so the most recent algorithm that, that uses this type of, type of technique to solve this problem is called GHOST, the Generalized and Scalable Optimal Express Decision Trees. And it's um, a paper that was published in 2020. This is, um, these are my students who, and my colleagues who've written this paper with me. And um, this is the most, um, the most scalable algorithm for optimal express decision trees right now. And since it was published in 2020, we are putting all kinds of bells and whistles on it to make it run faster and to do all kinds of other interesting things. And I would like to tell you how it works. So the way it works is that you start with all of the data points in um, one leaf. So here I have red points and, or sorry, blue points and yellow points, and I'm starting them all in a leaf that is predicted to be blue. So the tree is one leaf. <laughs> it's a very boring tree, and the prediction is, is just blue. So now um, what, what we do is um, we construct every possible tree of size two. So every possible tree with one split. So I'm gonna create every possible way I can split this data. Okay. And then I'm gonna use that to create every possible tree of you know size three and size four. I'm gonna keep going like that. So I'm, I'm literally gonna create every possible tree. And of course, I can't fit that all in this life because it's huge, right? The search space is absolutely enormous. It's a you know, combinatorial explosion. So I'll fit as much of the search space as I can on this one. Okay, so here, this is a, this is a, um, a single split here, single split here, single split here. And of course, I technically should be writing all of the possible single splits up there. Can't fit them all. And then from there, I keep splitting. So for, for example, for, for this guy, I would create every possible split I could here. So bump, 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 bump. And I've written two of them here. So here's one possible split. Here's another possible split. And then I would just continue doing that and enumerating all of the possible trees. But luckily for me, I don't actually have to enumerate all of them. There are some things that make my life a lot simpler. So the first one is that if I run into a pure leaf like this one, I don't need to continue splitting it. It makes no sense to continue splitting the pure leaf. Another thing I can do, and this is where the theorems come in, is I can notice that one of my splits is bad. So this particular split, as you can see, is quite bad. Um, and as it turns out, if I can prove the split is bad, then nothing I can do beyond this will remedy that bad split. So if I can simply prove with a theorem that this split is bad, then I don't need to search this entire part of the search space and it goes away. And I can, I can use my computational um, power just to search the part of the space where I think I might find an optimal tree, where, where I know I might find an optimal tree. Okay, so we have all these theorems and the theorems you know, um, just reduce the search space because it, it lets you prove that the optimal solution is not actually in there. Okay, so um, so if, if I have, you know, here I'm enumerating all of my trees, okay, and I have these theorems and it literally locks off very large chunks of the search space so that the remaining part of the search space that I actually have to search is really small. Okay, so I want to show you how some of these theorems work, or at least one theorem. Okay, so let's say that I'm building a tree and I'm building it. Yeah, because you're that first step you're doing, you have your elements, so you're looking at all possible partitions into size two. And I don't, I'm just trying to think of how bad that is. So, this is an NP hard problem, right? It's factorial in the number of features. Sure. Um, but we're going to solve it. 
<laughs> yeah, see, the complexity theorists don't like us very much. But, um, you know, we've sort, of, we, we've sort of needed to do this because it's practical and important. And the fact that we can get really, you know, optimal trees in sort of a matter of 10 seconds on realistically sized data sets is sort of a reason why we shouldn't listen to the complexity theorists all the time. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> Okay, so I'm constructing my tree from the top down. And I've decided to make these into leaves in this part of the, like in this part of my, I'm, I'm in this part of the space. Uh, somewhere else in the search space, I will not make these leaves, but right now I'm making them leaves in just this part of the space. Like there's another part of the space where I will change everything. But I haven't figured out what to do with these two leaves. Yeah, I, I, I know I'm not finished building this subtree here. Okay. So because I have decided what these two leaves, I, I've decided that these are gonna be leaves. So I can calculate the error rate in the leaves. So I know I've missed eight data points here. I know I've missed 15 points there. Okay. So um, when I go to calculate my objective, value, which is again, this classification error plus the constant times the number of leaves in the tree. I know that I can split the first term into these two terms. One term that handles the fixed leaves that I've already fixed. And the other term, which handles the leaves that I haven't figured out yet. Now I can't calculate this one because I don't know what I'm doing here. So I haven't figured out the rest of the tree. But for these two leaves, for the fixed leaves, I can calculate the loss, and it is exactly 23 points that I've missed. So I've got that part of the tree, that loss. So what I can do is create a lower bound, which keeps this term, because I know that's just 23. And then this term I'm going to set to zero, because I don't actually know what it's going to be. And so, well, it's going to be at least zero, because I'm going to miss at least yeah, I can miss more than zero, but I can't miss less than zero. So this is my lower bound on the objective. I call that E for bound. And that thing, um, what I can do with it is I can use it to compare with computations I've already done. So let's say that somewhere else in the computation, so maybe like way earlier while I'm searching this giant space, I have found a tree with only three leaves and I missed only 12 data points total. Okay. So earlier, right, I had found this lovely tree, three leaves, missed 12 data points. Now, if I look at my current tree, well, I already have missed 23 points and I have at least four leaves. So this is going to be at least four for my current tree. That's going to be at least 23. So nothing I do to this tree is going to get me a loss as low as that one. So in other words, the current best tree had an objective that was better than the lower bound, like the best possible thing I could get from my current partial tree. Okay, so because this is strictly less than that, then this tree that I'm building and any of its children, no, no child that I could possibly build from this will ever be as good as the current best one that I've already got. So I do not need to continue with this computation because this subtree is bad and it will never get me as good as what I already got. So I can stop searching this whole part of the search space. So this bound, that does this for us it's called the hierarchical objective lower bound. And I'm just going to stick this here into a theorem. <laughs> I think so it looks like a theorem. So if our best so far objective is less than the lower bound of my current fixed tree, then the tree and uh, its children are all suboptimal. And so then I don't need to search that whole part of the space. So hopefully you get the idea um, that there's this theorem. But there's also a whole lot of other theorems that kind of work together to try to reduce that search space so that we don't have to search it. 
So um, I'm just going to show you the list of bounds here. Oh, do we have a question? Yeah. So is that what you're using to consider something a bad split? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly. So I've I've now figured out that this whole this whole setup is bad. Okay. Right. Yeah. And this is for binary, and you're you're constructing a binary tree. Right now, I'm doing only binary. Yes. Does your algorithm do? Non-binary tree. Our algorithm only does binary trees because we haven't we haven't extended it to the non-binary case, but it's definitely possible to do it. All of the theorems will extend directly to the non-binary okay. case. But since we've this is still recent stuff, yeah. we haven't extended right, it. But yes, yes, we've we've been trying to extend it in different directions, um, make it faster, and also extend it to other objectives than just um, misclassification error. So we can now optimize like F1 score and area under the RC curve and all this other stuff. But we have not um, yet made it multi um, okay. multi way splits. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, there are a whole lot of theorems that work together to reduce the search space, and I've shown you one theorem, but there are a whole lot of them, and I I don't have time to go through all of them. I would I would love to spend a whole day, and I could sort of well maybe an hour, I could sort of go through all of these bounds and show you what they are, but I won't do it. Um, I'll just kind of tell you very briefly um, kind of what they what some of them are. So the leaf bound tells you how many leaves could remain in an optimal tree. So in other words, as you're building the tree, how many leaves could possibly re could possibly remain and still the tree could be potentially optimal. And that tells you kind of how big your search space really is. Um, we have um, also a bound called equivalent points bound. So if you have two points that are right on top of each other, and they have opposite signs, then there's no way you can get both of those points correctly classified. So you, um, you'll you miss at least one of those two points. And knowing that information helps you create better lower bounds. Um, and so we, we have bounds that incorporate that information. Um, and points are very often right on top of each other. So that's, <laughs> this is not, a, not something that is unusual at all. Um, we also have permutation bounds because if you have trees that are permutations of each other, they have all the same leaves except they're just listed in a different order, then those trees are equivalent to each other and you don't need to search um, all the permutations, you only need to search sort of, you know, one of the, one of the, the equivalence class of trees there. Um, also, we have a bound called the support bound, which tells us that each leaf has to have a certain number of data points in it, because if it doesn't, then you wouldn't actually want to even bother creating that, that um, making that split at all. Okay, so hopefully you get the idea. So I know these are just kind of like words on the slides for to you, but to me, these are like superheroes that, to, that work together to try to like save the world. So anyway, um, so we have this collection of, of analytical bounds that, that reduce the search space and, and they really keep, they really make it a lot smaller so that we can search um, the remaining part of the space. So I want to show you um, a result here of this algorithm on the recidivism data from Florida. So this um, algorithm says, okay, if people are, if, if somebody is, is young, predict that they will be arrested. If they are not young, um, and remember, these are this is not just all people, this is a specific population that's in the police department filling in a form. So, because they've been arrested. So this is not just, you know, the general public predict that you all, because you're young, are, should be arrested. No, that's not true. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, and, and it's a lesson to show you that you always should consider the population <laughs> when you're making predictions. Okay. So if the person is older, well, let's count the number of prior offenses they've had. Um, it, if they've had um, more prior offenses, well, we, we look at their age if they're young, uh, younger than 22 and a half, so kind of like in between these numbers and then and so on and so forth. So you can see age appears kind of fairly often. Age is actually quite an important feature in predicting whether someone will uh, be arrested in, in Florida, in this district in Florida at this period of time. Okay, and I wanna point out since, since people were asking that the training time for this tree was 34 seconds. Okay, so 34 seconds is really not that long to wait for a, a tree that's guaranteed to be optimal. Yeah. So how are we testing all of the possible splits with real numbers like when we have the age? Okay, so you take all of the data points and you, you, you take all the people and you look at all of their ages 
and you put a split between every possible age. Okay. And that's how that's that's how all of these are. So in other words, we had someone in the database whose age was 19 and someone whose age was 20. Mm -hmm. So we plot this possible split between 19 and a half. And then we did the same thing for somebody who's 22 and someone who's 23. <laughs> Yeah, so it's every, it's literally every possible split um, <laughs> that, that can that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. So can you um, use your tree algorithms to do natural language analysis to you know to predict like the next uh, word piece that will come things like that? Um, we haven't tried that. I'm not an NLP researcher, so uh, I haven't. Because you're effectively constructing some sort of grammar that really works for prediction. But that's a good point. Um, I, mean, I think it would be really interesting to try that out. Yeah, we have we just haven't we just haven't done that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um so the sense I'm getting is that um while the worst case situation you might have a really long lot of time, most of the time. That ends up not being true. Um, as someone who spends your time building these algorithms, do you have a sense when someone hands you a new data set? Is there, do you tend to have a sense of, oh, this one is going to take some time? Or, oh, this data set, we can do it very quickly. Do you have a sense? Of yeah, that? I do. Yeah. So if it's a normal data set where there's, you know, like patient data or anything like that where you can predict perfectly. <laughs> Um, it generally takes a very short amount. Of time. Uh, the only types of data sets where it really takes a very long time are things like games, where where uh, you have to consider sort of seventeen steps in advance right. um, in order to sort of make a move now. Okay. Um, or or things like yeah, I mean, like I was saying yesterday, you wouldn't want to use a decision tree on on computer vision problems except at the end of a neural network because you wouldn't want to split on pixels that wouldn't be interpretable and it would give you a huge tree that's totally meaningless. Okay. Um, so, but most of the time, I mean, for, for every real data problem that I've, that I've come across, um, we can construct these trees very, very quickly. Yeah. I work on a lot of different applications, so that helps me answer your questions like that. And you'll notice that the accuracy is not incredibly accurate, um, but that's kind of like what, accuracy you would expect for this type of data. It's, it's really hard to predict whether somebody is going to be arrested within a couple of years of, of filling out a form. And um, one nice thing you'll notice is that the training accuracy and test accuracy are very similar to each other. Now, remember, the test set is totally different than the training set, right? The, the test people, we've never seen them before. Um, so it's really good to be able to generalize from the training set to the test set. Yep. And what was the size of your test set relative to your training set? Uh, I can't remember for this particular um, one that they did, but what we usually do is fivefold cross validation. So it's usually four fifths on four fifths on training, and then one fifth on testing. But you can also do half and half. You can do you know whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. And this is several thousand individuals, by the way. This is like you know, like seven thousand people or something like that. Okay. Um, so let me just give you some perspective here. Um, so just step up now that I finished decision trees. Um, so why are, we, why are we sitting trees again? Um, and the reason is because decision trees are interpretable. Well, I mean, <laughs> really Kurt and Ghost are, uh, but C4.5, like I said, it, its parameters tend to give you these kind of overwhelmingly large trees. But these two algorithms kind of reliably give you small trees that you can, you can actually understand if the features themselves are interpretable. Um, as it turns out, if you average together many trees, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, um, you can get really amazing results. So, for example, boosted decision trees is the best out of the box um, machine learning method uh, in existence, and it has been that way for many years. And that method, um, what it does is it, it averages together many trees, it creates a weighted average of trees, and it's very reliable. Um, it's more reliable than neural networks for, for um, like neural networks, I said, are, are hard to train. So you can't really rely on, you know, taking the data, sending it into a neural network and getting something good. 
neural networks, you have to, the user has to like tune the parameters really sharply. Whereas with boosted decision trees, you just pick it, pick, take the data set out, throw it at boosting, and it actually generally does pretty well, which is, you know, it's reliably good. And it's a combination of trees, overfitted trees. And random forest is also a combination of trees, if you've ever heard of that algorithm. Okay, um, so we've studied some of the oldest algorithms and the newest algorithm. We learned C4.5 splitting criteria. We learned Cart's printing criteria, and that led directly to um, Ghost's objective. And then we talked about Ghost's algorithm, which is dynamic programming with bounds, with theoretical bounds. And um, I'm going to leave you with some things to think about. So first of all, um, what can we use trees for? So if you now, you now, all of you have the knowledge of what, what these trees are, and I'm sure you can figure out how to go and um, you know, download the code for these algorithms and run them. And if you can't, you can talk to Lessie this afternoon. She can help you figure, figure some of this stuff out. Um, but you, you can think to yourself, okay, now that I have this tool, or now that I potentially have this tool, what can I use it for? So maybe if I'm working in patient diagnosis or um, trying to understand medical data, you know, trying to create a screening, a screening algorithm, figuring out whether someone might need to come back for getting a diagnosis, um, maybe I can use decision trees. Like if this patient has this symptom, um, and then we can ask them whether they also have this thing. And if they have that thing, then send them back for a diagnosis, another test. Um, you can think about predicting who is eligible for a loan, right? You can use decision tree algorithms for that. Um, you can also think about, um, you know, how, how can I improve decision tree algorithms now that you know the state of the art in decision tree learning? Um, how can you adapt the algorithms if one type of prediction is more important than another? Maybe you could use a weighted loss function. Maybe you could change, you know, <laughs> To change the uh, change the loss function completely. Um, also, questions like um, how can you allow experts to kind of choose between many trees that are all about equally good? And these are questions that I'm actively like trying to answer. Um, and you know, there, there, but there are lots of ways to answer these questions, and you can try to answer them in your own ways if you want to. There's you know, it's it's a very creative field, and you can come up with your own ways to do things, and it's viable and interesting. All right, so that is the end of decision trees. And I will sacrifice the last two minutes. And then next time I'm gonna start on ROC curves. Uh, and then I'll talk about GAMS. So yeah, so I'll, I'll take the last two minutes for questions. I have one question about like you mentioned averaging decision trees can like, is like say they're one of the best arbitrable classifiers. Like we started off like, by saying that decision trees are really nice and intuitive and interpretable. So does, does the interpretability like, sort of suffer when we average or is there like a way to trade off how much like the extent of averaging we want to do to improve accuracy while also not uh, making the decision tree do the most interpretability? Yeah, that's a good question. So there's three axes. There's accuracy, interpretability, and computation. Because again, these are very hard computational problems. And so what we've been trying to do is we, we've been trying to, so let's say we run boosted decision trees and get some kind of black box giant combination of trees, right? It's a black box because it combines a lot of trees together and they're all like overfitted trees. So they're all way too big, not very interpretable. So what we can do is try to leverage information from what the black box is predicting to try to make our computations faster so we can get an interpretable model of the same accuracy as the boosted tree, <laughs> but um, get it get it faster thanks to that boosted tree. So there's a lot of ways to trade off between all of these three things. Um, we have a proof in um, one of our latest papers as to um, if you use a boosted tree with these parameters, um, how deep does a single tree need to be to have the VC dimension, same VC dimension as um, as the boosted tree? <laughs> so um, so some of these things really kind of can, can work together to get you somewhere in between, you know, good accuracy, good computation, good interpretability. Um, you mentioned earlier the idea of sort of combining a neural network and a decision tree. And I was wondering if, um, if I can imagine 
providing something pre-trained to a decision tree, but is there a way of backpropagating that information from the decision tree like through the neural network? There is, and that's that's what my colleague does. So so I, I don't do this myself. This is not this is my, not me, but he's doing some really interesting work. So what he'll do is put a put a decision tree uh, and he'll give it the architecture. So he'll tell it, I want it to be a tree of depth three, uh, and it's going to be fully, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, a full tree of depth three. So so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that, something like that. And then he'll just he'll just back propagate straight through all of it. Uh, and create this neural network with this decision tree at the end. And he claims that all of the splits and, and what he's learning at the end are, are actually interpretable. And actually, and he's visualized them. You can actually see what they are. Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting what he's doing. Yeah, I can, I can give you the reference later if you remind me. I just, yeah, I won't do it later, right now. <laughs> are there any alternatives to decision trees as like interpretable? Well, we're, thank you for asking that. We're doing GEMS um, but, but on uh, Thursday. Yeah. I mean, so decision trees are logical models, and there are lots of other kinds of logical models too. There are rule sets. Um, rule sets are things like um, if you have, uh, like, you know, if if a and b, or if if this is true, if a is true and b is true, or if c is true, or if d is true and e is true then predict yes, right? So these are rule, rule sets. Yeah. So you can, you can try to optimize these things as well. So it's another type of logical model. Um, you can also do decision lists, which are kind of like in between So decision lists are like a rule, rule lists, like if A and B, uh, then Y equals one also. Uh, C uh, and D and E, then uh, predict you know predict y equals zero or y equals negative one or something like that. So so this is kind of a combination like it has rules because it's like combination you know uh, combinations of, of features here. Um, and, and you keep going. You can do if else if else if else if and then an else condition at the bottom. Um, so it's like a decision tree in the sense that it's like a one sided decision tree. But in each split, you can have multiple conditions on the features. Um, so those are all alternatives to decision trees that um, people heavily work on. I've worked on all of these things, um, and I still I'm still working on I'm still working on this one really heavily. Yeah. Um, you mentioned mentioned um, cross validation, and something um, that made me wonder is if you're taking like slightly smaller subsets of your training set and you're making a different decision tree from different random subsets, how different are those decision trees with this um, optimal decision tree? Okay, so the answer is they can be very, very different. And is that okay? I think so. <laughs> because often there are um, a lot of almost equally good models for any given data set. And somebody who studies that very heavily is Lesia, <laughs> who's <laughs> right here. So she's actually studying the number, like the, the number of almost optimal models um, for, for a given data set. And as it turns out, uh, as she's found, uh, many data sets have lots and lots of um, almost optimal models that can be very different from each other. Yeah. And that's a good thing from my perspective, because it means that the user gets to choose which one they want. <laughs> and so that's what I was posing as a question um, to think about. Well, I guess it's fun, but. The question that I posed was, you know, how do you get the user to choose from all of these almost optimal models, right? Because they're all about equally good. So how does the user get to pick which one they want to use? And do you have a similarity measure between these models? So you could like find like this is a very common sort of sub portion of them or so there are different ways to measure the similarities of models. So one way is do they use the same features? Like you can do an edit distance on which features are being used in the different models. You can also look at how similar their predictions are on the whole data set. Um, you can also look at um, that there are other ways to measure measure similarities, um, but but those are those are two of them. Yeah. Good questions. Um, I know you said not to think too much about the complexity, but uh, I was wondering, do you know if this algorithm this algorithm is also NP complete? Like, is it an NP or is it just NP? So the problem is NP complete. Okay. 
Um, so there's no polynomial time approximation to the solution. Um, you know, it's factorial in number of variables, so it's, it's very hard. Um, but we're still able to solve it. So, okay. yeah, I don't know. you know, the complexity theorist would look down the nose at me and say, what are you doing? Why are you trying to solve hard problems? And the answer is because I need to, because I care about the world and I want to be able to produce models people can understand and use. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll release you and I'll see you later today.